Welcome to episode number 66 of About the Cards podcast live tonight on YouTube. As always with, as always with me, my host, Stefan Loffer at Junk Wax Twins, Ben Wilson at our trading cards. I'm Tim Shevler, Big Shep 79. You're a podcast by collectors for collectors. I'm going to bring you a smart and insightful podcast discussing trading card collecting. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific. 10 Central. On YouTube, Periscope, and Facebook Live. You always follow us on Twitter at About the Cards. We're available as a podcast anywhere you can locate a podcast. iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Overcast, all those fun ones there. Uh, you can check out our website, aboutthecards.wordpress.com. You can find us on Flipchat. Uh, and we also have a site on Spreadshirt.com uh, to, to buy any of the merchandise. If you want a cool shirt, let us know. We have a special guest host tonight. At the Mike Summer. Mike Summer's with us tonight. What's up, Mike? How is it going, boys? Oh, it's good. I'm glad to have you back on. We haven't had a, somebody hanging out with us for a while, so it's great to have you on. So how you been, bud? I've been good. Thanks yeah. for well. Yeah, summer's winding down. Fall's getting started. Kids are back in school and junior high sports and all that good stuff going on. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. Nice. You seem yeah. a little old for junior high sports. <laughs> yeah, I dominate. I, I would, I would, I would hope so. I heard you, heard you scored third in the volleyball tournament. That's true. That's true. I was spiking in those in those little girls' faces all night long. All night. Hey, you got to. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm only five foot nothing, so they're still like bigger than I am. So, so you and Angela might be a fair match. Yeah. Yeah. So, so do you go by the Mike Fall now that now that we're turning the calendar? The Mike Fall. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. Ha ha. Okay. That's a good one. That's a good so, one. You're funny. <laughs> funny, funny. Steph, how's your week been, bud? Oh, it's pretty good. Um, outside of finding a kitten outside that needed some medical attention and uh, work kicking my butt, I'm excited for Friday and uh, we've got a lazy weekend planned ahead. So, what's happening Friday? My birthday. Your birthday is Friday? Is hey, you're gonna be what 19? Uh, <laughs> I wish now 32. That's not that bad. 1987. Ooh. That means Thank that you. my 87 is finally my 87 tops is finally vintage. It's slightly older than I am actually because yeah. they were released in February, January, yeah. somewhere in there. Well, uh, real quick, you remember our buddy uh, Nick Duante that uh, writes for Forbes. Yeah, he included me in an article this week in Forbes, uh, talking, asking me about my thoughts on the return of Bowman Sterling. So uh, you can check that out. And uh, I tweeted out he did as well uh, the link to that. Because our listeners listen to read Forbes. Very yeah, nice. You know, I thought it was cool. Like I, well, Very nice. Off yes. the bucket list, I was in Forbes. So yeah, and uh, you know, it's been a fun week, and I got a little basketball collecting before the season starts. So. I'm excited uh, to get some Sacramento Kings back into my collection. Yeah, and so speaking of uh, non-baseball hobby cards and uh, collecting, you ready to announce what team you collect for hockey? For hockey? You teased it. I did tease it. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where you – like I'm very particular on, on uh, branding, name, logo. I wanted to look good when I was a kid. You know, it's like, okay, whatever. Sure. City Royals, and I and I love the color blue. And I, I mean, I couldn't do the Wild because that's just a stupid. I'm sorry, that's just a dumb name to me. I, I, don't, I don't get you it. You have a nice logo though. Yeah, the colors remind me of like a bad Christmas sweater. No, those are old uniforms. Mm. <laughs> so uh, I am going to be a fan of Edmonton Oilers. Cop uh, out. Yeah. Why? Going with an original six, I like. The, I like their. I think they got cool. They got a cool logo. They got a good history. They, you know, up and coming. I could, you know, hop root for them. Uh, so, as long as you're not a Blackhawks fan, then we'll, no, it, or, not, Dallas, or Dallas Star. Yeah, it wasn't going to be one of those two teams. Um, I didn't really want a team that like moved. 
Uh, sure. You know, so, you know, I would have been Hartford Whalers hands down. For sure. Still existed as, as the Whalers. So, yep. So, uh, yeah, Edmonton Oilers. Uh, let's hop in. The week that was last week's release is Tops Living Week 80. Uh, we told you it was not going to be a pleasant week. It was not. Card 238, Yasuo Pui outfielder out for the Cleveland Indians, sold a few over 2,300. Card 239, Brian Reynolds, rookie outfielder for the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, over 2,600. And two card 240, Felix Hernandez, pitcher for the Seattle Mariners, came in 10 shy of 2,300. Um, it's the second worst week I think we've had. And uh, so check out at Tops Living Staff for full breakdown of where these cards fall respectively in the set by team and by position. Hey, we know that guy. So, yeah, Doug, yeah, at least I didn't jump onto the Las Vegas bandwagon. Couldn't do that. It had Seattle started this year uh, or next year. I would have probably maybe thought of them, but uh, they're not playing until 2021, and I kind of want to get going, so. Uh, we also had 2019 Bowman Chrome drop, 2019 Panini XR Football. Both of those uh, popped out. Um, and then also 2019 Panini Flawless Collegiate Football. We're going to talk a little about collegiate products later in the show, but uh, that dropped. So we'll hop into Hot Off the Press as the new new releases for this week. Tops Living Week 81, card, two number, card 241, CC Sabathia, pitcher of the New York Yankees, uh, retiring at the end of this year. Card 242, Tuki Toussaint, rookie pitcher for the Atlanta Braves. And card 243, Mikhail Franco, third baseman of the Philadelphia Phillies. Someone tweeted out, oh, man, we could have had three dreadlocks this week. Why doesn't CC have dreadlocks? Um, I get CC's card. I'm surprised Tuki didn't have one already because he's been in a lot of top products early on. Franco kind of like a – 2010. Uh, Frank, yeah, Franco's like, eh. I don't know. I'm not super excited about this week, guys. Any thoughts? Uh, CC looks nice, and I know a few of our friends were talking about picking it up. But uh, if I were casually collecting the set, that would be the only one I'd get. But it's the Yankee, so screw them. Yeah, and, uh, you, you know, I, I thought it was cool since the whole, you know, CC's pitching his last game in Yankee Stadium in the regular season. You know, it was a good timing for it. I mean, the Yankees, of course, are overproduced and overrepresented in this set. As well, a- it should have been a brewer. Pardon? Should have been a brewer. Of course, man. That that what was at 08 when when he was pitching on three days rest every, every uh, start. Like that? Yeah. Something, man. But, uh, no, it's good to see CC get one. And, uh, you know, he's a relative local guy here in Northern California. So uh, I, I've already picked up one. Yeah. Uh, 2019 Panini Donner's Football Factory said dropped 50 bucks. Um, 400 card base set. It's 250 uh, past and present NFL stars, 50 rookie cards, 50 rated rookie cards. But you're also going to receive one Donner's Threads Green Relic card when you buy the factory set. And every box includes all 50 photo variation that swap images. So nice. we, you know, this released earlier on, but this is a good opportunity to, to, to get the whole set together uh, at a decent price. I mean, I, I, it's probably less than a box of Donner's football goes for right now. You're going to get a relic card and then you're going to get all the photo variations. So not, not a bad deal. I, I know that was it a 2018 uh, blowout or David Adams had it for like $24 uh, this last week, and you got to think Lamar Jackson's in there, Baker, Sam Darnold, uh, Josh Rosen, Josh Allen are all in there. So I think they had a bit of a discount on uh, 2017 as well. Hmm. With Patty Mahomes. Indeed. Yeah, it's not a bad way to go. I mean, for baseball is my primary sport, but I usually try to get at least one football set and one basketball set each uh each season just so i've kind of got that captured and um downers isn't isn't a bad way to go at all it's a fairly comprehensive set and Mm -hmm. the variations in there too it's it's a good way to go yeah especially getting 100 rookie cards i mean so you're you're not going to miss out on it i just find it weird like a few years ago when miles garrett was the number one pick he was a rookie card in there but he wasn't a rated rookie and because all of the rated rookies are the glamour positions. Right. And he, but he was the number one pick. So it just doesn't comprehend to me like, oh, just because he plays defense, he's not 
the best player in that draft or considered one of the top players of that draft. Yet, you know, some scrub quarterback that was taking the seventh round is considered a right rated rookie because he plays well quarterbacks. So it's just indicative of the the position and, and really the only position in that sport that gets any long term love. Yep. That's why if uh you know my big thought if you if you collect football and you love football, um, you know, you your best bet is to collect quarterbacks before they break out. If you're gonna if you wanna, you know, you like a certain quarterback. If you like other positions, running backs, receivers, tight ends, defense, offensive linemen, the best time to collect those guys is in the offseason of the rookie year or their second or third year because the prices have come down because the new crops come in. You know, yeah. you can still two, get Kamara for nothing now. Two to three years after the fact, that would be when you can go back and gobble up a lot of that stuff. You know, when you think about it, the, the top 32 quarterbacks, you know, are, are always going to be – in the spotlight, you have the backups where you only have 64 of them, you know, give or take. And, uh, you know, good 20 of those guys are going to probably be older, you know, the, the, the Josh McCowns of the world. So really any given year, you only have probably about 40 younger, if that quarterbacks to really prospect and speculate on. So it's a, it's a very small crop year in, year out. Very, very true. Uh, so it's just, you know, one of those interesting things about this, how, how the sports are so very different. Uh, 2019 Tops Heritage Minor League Baseball dropped today. Around $58 a box from Blowout. Uh, but on Tops' website, they had it for $45, which is a heck of a buy, I think. Uh, 18 packs per box, 8 cards per pack, 1 autograph, 1 memorabilia or manufactured relic, and then you're going to get one nineteen seventy Super Baseball box loader. Uh, included it's a 220 card base set with the 1970 design of in, that includes the minor league prospects uh prospects to look for in here you obviously wander franco uh nolan G gorman joey bart julio pablo martinez julio rodriguez luis robert uh are a couple of the guys that you probably heard of before that are in the set uh there's also a promotion to make your pro debut uh, that's come back. In each box, there are two entries for a grand prize that includes both a one-day contract with the Rocket City Trash Pandas. Huh. Minor league teams have the best names. Right. And a card in 2020 Tops Pro Debut, which is pretty awesome. So that uh, that drops today, and uh, it just kind of extends that Tops Heritage set. Uh, out a little bit, uh, you know, kind of in a little of addition if you want to look at it that way uh, as a subset. So, yeah, I ended up picking up three boxes of that. I had them pre ordered. And so, um, it's one of my, my favorite minor league sets. Yeah. Especially that 70s design, 70s, 70s tops, one of my favorite designs. So, uh, 2018 19 Upper Deck Clear Cut Hockey dropped as well, $70 a box, one pack per box. One card per pack, you're going to receive an autograph. We originally talked about this on episode 55 back on July 3rd. Uh, I got pushed back a ways. The, this is basically the base series that's been upgraded with both acetate and autographs, and all of the cards are uh, – all the autographs are on card. So, on card. On card. So, you know, build that base set. One card at one one seventy dollar pack at a time. Um, upper deck also dropped 2019 20 upper deck artifacts hockey, ninety five dollars a box, eight cards per pack, four cards or I'm sorry, eight packs per box, four cards per pack. Uh, you're gonna get three autographs uh, or three autograph mim or Abram, Abram bounty cards, Abram bounty cards, uh, four serial number cards and one rookie redemption. It's a 220 card base set, uh, debuting first year players and rookies. Autographs and memorabilia are a key part of the release, uh, because of its such early release date. Artifacts can't directly include 2019 draft picks, uh, but they have a workaround. So, um, Upper Deck can't make the NHL cards of these players until they debut, so they have a rookie redemption program. There are 40 regular rookie redemptions available. Uh, the, you, the upper deck bounty program returns to artifacts, uh, and a result revolves around the RM insert set, offering up an incentive to build the first, to build the full set. Those that complete get a bounty. 
uh, and the cards are not available in packs. Uh, all who finish the set and register it at the Upper Deck Bounty website by entering codes on the back of the cards will get two additional cards, making it a 50-card set instead of the 48-card set. And for the first 25 to complete the quest, they will get an additional nine-card set of the 2005-06 Retro, plus an exclusive Austin Matthews autograph card. That's pretty cool. It's cool that it's interactive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I got to, you know, commend uh, Upper Deck for, for doing a program like that. Yeah. Open packs. Go check out their website. Build a set. Be rewarded. Yep. Yeah, I think you know, that same thing applies to EPAC as well. And so I, I kind of feel like it's one of those things that they did to help continue to push EPAC and promote EPAC and add some additional value um, to, to buying some of those since the secondary market on a lot of those EPAC cards is, is not real high. So yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty innovative idea, I thought. Oh, very, very interesting. Well, uh, I think they've done something similar in years past, uh, like the Yankee Stadium Legacy, and um, I think there was another hockey set a couple years back where they did something similar, where if you're the first however many to register the set, you got something special on in addition to. Yeah, I'm good with them coming up with something to interact with collectors as opposed to just pissing out online set after set after set just as money grabs you know th- th- this is what the the companies should be doing things like this yeah it's fun it- it's a quest it- yeah. it's you know a- i like it's like a pack redemption it's like hey build this subset that's within the packs and then you have to go online and put in the information and that way we'll- we have a deadline anybody that does it gets this if you're one of the first 25 you get a cool bonus you know yeah it's like a scavenger hunt almost. I mean, it's kind of neat. Yeah. And it gets people trading potentially and, and, uh, or working I, together. I think, yeah, yeah. I think it's much cooler. You know, it's, it's almost like a partnership between us and the manufacturer as opposed to, hey, I'm going to give you this product next week and you're going to blindly give me your money. No, I just, uh, I was, I was really excited to talk about that tonight. I mean, it, it just to me, it's, uh, you know, innovative in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, so now, now as we talk about going online and buying stuff, runs in the next set. Tops Chrome Sapphire Baseball uh, dropped today. Uh, if you blinked, you missed it. It's fifty dollars. Uh, was fifty dollars a box? Four cards per pack. Eight, four packs per box. Eight cards per pack. You're gonna get one rookie autograph in your box. It's a sub, the seven hundred card base set. You know, like series one and two put together. It's exclusive to Tops Online. Uh, two thousand eighteen had a hundred card base set and three rookie autographs per box for $200. This year, it's a blaster-style uh, format, and each box, like I said, contained the 32 cards. Cardboard Connection reported that the product was sold out in the first 8 to 10 minutes. And then we even saw some tweets. Uh, Nathan here on Twitter said, I hear that there was no purchase limit to these orders. How can this be? Is the goal to only allow a few buyers huge amounts? There has to be a way to make this right and let more people buy cards without having to go on eBay uh, for three, two to three times the price. Ridiculous. He said he received an email at 8.38 a.m. and checked at 8.39, and they were already completely sold out. So uh, I, there's not really a way to fix these online things unless they were to limit it to, say, four boxes in order, uh, yeah. eight, ten boxes in order, whatever it happens to be, uh, arbitrary number. Uh but you know, first come first serve. It's a, it, I think it was available to more people this year, being at fifty dollars a box, right? Than two hundred dollars a box, right? But not if it, not if you're not limiting it. It's not. It's only available to to anybody that's there first. I mean, but I'm you know, but but I'm saying more people felt like they had an opportunity to buy a box or two, and spend a hundred dollars if they got two boxes versus buying one box last year. It cost them two hundred dollars. Right. So, so this set's been out what now? Four years, I think. If I'm not mistaken, something like that. Four or five y- no, years. I think this is a third or fourth year. Yeah, I think it's the fourth. If I'm not mistaken, I think they did uh, 16 and 17, and those are those were you buy a complete set. Yep. And and it, you know it's a little more expensive because it is online. It's you know tops Chrome, and then last year they went to the you know it's it's just a online hobby box type thing and and 
now you're doing it blaster style. If personally, if I could have one set each year, it would be stadium club. If I could have sure. a second set, it would be between Gypsy Queen. This is just my my personal opinion. Gypsy Queen and Top Sapphire. I love this set that much. And I'm probably not going to be able to complete the A's team set because it's like 26 cards. And I I, I would imagine the singles are going to be what? Eight bucks a piece? Ten bucks a piece on the secondary market? I mean, are, are we thinking that that's, that's high, low? Probably a bit high, yeah. At, at, at five bucks a piece, you know, you're still looking at a hundred to 150 bucks, depending on your team. And of course who plays for your team. Yeah. You know, so some of the so, cards are going to be a little bit more scarce and a little bit more, you, you know, costly. Yeah. Sapphire dropped in 17 in 18. This is the third year of the product. Okay. So the first year then it was, it was done a, as a complete set, which I think it's fair. A, a set like this should be done that way. Why do you think they're going to be so much? It, it doesn't look like singles from prior years are 30, 50 cents. I mean, wh why do you think they're going to be eight bucks a piece? I don't remember how much 2017 cost him. I don't know if you can pull that up or Steph. Um, I'm but checking my cards right now, there's a ton of them available for 30 or 40 cents a piece. Because it, it, they were sold for like a hundred dollars or something like that. If I'm not mistaken for the whole set, all 700 cards. So on the second, uh, five autos, 1500 a box. Last year it was 199 Yeah, I remember I, I think I spent $25 for my team set back in 2017, so about a buck a card. Last year I think I spent 35 The reason I would think now is our friend uh, CRT Sports Cards, uh, Chris Torres, had said, you know, if perfect coalition, you're going to need 21-plus boxes to complete a full 700-card set. And because so many of these are going to be resold, hoping to, you know, get a multiplier of three or four X, um, I, I don't see a whole lot of these coming out. I think it's going to be very similar to like the yellow Walgreens parallels from Series One, where they're going to be a little bit more scarce, and and the ones that are available are going to be four, five, six dollars on the low end, hmm. and, and name a star, you know, Mike Trout, so to speak. You know, guys, they're going to be 20, 20, 30 bucks a piece. I would, I would imagine. I could yeah. be wrong. I feel like it's good. Do they have stars? <laughs> oh. Got me. But, you know, you know, when you start to look at, at you know, the, the, the Matt Chapmans and stuff like that, yeah, you're, you're probably talking about 12 to $15. Well, um, I'm, I'm looking at 18 top chrome sapphire baseball, and somebody has. It looks like you know they listed all the cards one through two hundred from last year, uh, and they're they're in a range from two ninety nine up to forty nine ninety nine. And the forty nine ninety nine was Judge. Uh, he was card, he was card one. It was a rookie All Star Cup card. Uh, hmm. You know they had uh, Clayton Kershaw's base card here going for seven bucks. So you know I, I could see this being uh, two fifty for. Um, in, in, you know, John Gray for the Rockies was two fifty. So, I, I mean, I hope no. I hope I'm wrong because I mean, like I, I said, this is a set I'm excited for, but I, I just I, I think people are going to ask the world for it because they have it and we don't. Yeah, and it was so I, limited. I think early on it might be that way as it comes down. It, it might it might drop a little bit as people just want the autographs out of there and then the the you know the the rookie cards. Uh, to get uh, that are in there. So blowout, it had put out a wanted poster today. They're offering a uh, hundred dollars for, uh, for boxes early on. It was 75 and then it got bumped up a few minutes later to a hundred. So basically two times what people purchased the box for. They, uh, they want to do that. So, so yeah, if you're out there and you're listening, Hey, I need the A's. Hall of Fame cards tweeted out. Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame cards for sale tweeted out. Tops doesn't care about letting regular customers get online special boxes. They just care about the money. And then he put out the little guy sitting at the table. Change my mind. Tops sold them for fifty bucks. That that's not, that's not them cashing in, right? They're not the ones buy selling the box for two or three hundred dollars when there's only fifty dollars worth of cards inside. Because that's what Tops values those cards at. 
Right. They're saying this box to us is worth 50 bucks. If you pay more or less than that, that's up to you. But we value this as a $50 product. That's where they're making their money. So that tells you that if the box goes to $100, there could be some skunk boxes where your $100 ends up to being less than 50 bucks worth of value. Correct? Well, who, who all is on the, the checklist? Uh, Guerrero's on there and Tatis is on there. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's, I, I, I don't remember all the names. There was like five or six names that jumped out at me. Yeah. I think if you get one of those guys, you, you're going you're gonna to make your money back. But if you get anybody else on that checklist, and that's why I think the base cards are going to sell at least for a while. They're going to be Pete more. Alonso. Yeah, you have Pete Alonso's base rookies in there. Uh, you know, you have key rookie cards in here, and those are Pete what's going to cash in. But if you if you your rookie card that you get in there is Ronnie Rodriguez of the Detroit Tigers, Ooh. and they're selling. If you look at the eBay sold listings, they're selling for 180 to 200 bucks a piece. Yeah. So it's not like people aren't, you, you know. I, just, I don't agree with the statement that Tops is money hungry on this. I no, I, I, 50 bucks. Yes, they got their money regardless. It doesn't matter if they had one buyer or if they had a, a thousand buyers, right? They sold out. It was a good program for them. Yeah. The issue that that us, the collectors, that they got shorted, those of us that, that tried to go on and had them in their cart and couldn't check out fast enough, it just basically comes down to the fact that yes, they should have a limit. That My way, question. it allows more people to have it because it, it, sure. it is going to be wanted on the secondary market, and now it's going to be one of those things like, hey, I have one, you know, quadruple my money, and you can have it. Mike, I have a question for you. So, with them selling, I mean, I, I don't understand what people are expecting to to get out of this, being that. It's an online only product, and as somebody that, that does buy products, you know, at a, at a wholesale price, and, and and either opens them or sell, you pre order a lot of stuff, and you either open it and then resell the the contents, or you open some and sell the rest. You know, what is your thought on on something like this, where instantly, half hour after the product releases, it's selling for double, triple, quadruple what it originally sold for? Yeah, I don't really understand. Um, what is driving consumers to buy some of these things at three or four X the, the retail cost? Because the, the inherent product itself isn't that much different, isn't that much better than the, the more widely available stuff. I mean, I think the same thing applies, whether it's this, um, you know, Ginter X sold for significantly more than, than the cost direct, um, and, and even looking at contenders basketball um, is selling for so much more than it should be oh. selling for. We're going to talk about that later tonight, too. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. And, and so I, I think there's just some crazy consumers out there who are who are buying this stuff up. Um, I don't think that there's a, a legitimate reason for it, because once it's open, the majority of people aren't getting 4x the value. They're, they're not. Most people are not going to be getting four hundred dollars. Whether whether you're selling um, the base cards at a, a bigger rate or or what, but because like there's not enough um, good autos in there for the majority of people to to make one hundred fifty or two hundred dollars back on their money. So, Steph, do you think this is an account where people have the have FOMO, like fear of missing out on this newest thing? People are able to flip it and make tons of money, become, and this is, you know, they're going to be, uh, you know, swimming in like swimming like uh, Donald Duck, or I mean, uh, what was his name, uh, Scrooge McDuck, and all the all the coins. Uh, or do you just yeah. think it's just stupid? I, I, to me, I just think it's stupid. But what do you think, Bud? It, it definitely is, and it, it, j just from what we're seeing, I mean, I, I had a few screenshots up of people selling for four times what they purchased it for, and with a receipt for two thousand uh, dollars paid. Okay, now doing some math, two thousand by fifty is what? Four hundred boxes, something like that. No, forty. 40. Okay. 
Now, if they had put in a limit for each person to be able to purchase five. Okay, fair. But now you're getting everyone to rush out because they know that they can have a chance at that Alonzo. They can have a chance at that Williams Estadillo. They can have a chance at that. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the auto checklist. Come on now. He is. He um, is. But uh, it's just it, it, it's one of those where you know you're, you're seeing people trying to find this new latest limited edition numbered something that they can flip and sell, and unfortunately, it looks like this is another one of those cases. Yeah, I, I just it's it's one of those things to me. I just I don't understand why everybody is getting so upset at. Uh, I mean, you know, the I, the thing that upsets me is they could have limited it, but at the same point, that's I think that's the only thing that they did wrong here. Um. Yeah, you know. so, there's no other be- there's no other beef on tops. Yeah. The only other a- thing is is if they if they put those if they you know in a Chrome box if they put because uh, you always know tops Chrome box they always have the, the right. cardboard piece at the very bottom to because the packs don't completely fill that box and they always yeah. have a little piece of cardboard on the bottom of them. What if they put four sapphire packs in every box? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a fan of online only. We've, we've talked about that every, like every week. But, um, you know, ultimately, I think that this is just one of those things where it's the hot product. Everybody wants one. It's a big deal that it sold out in seven minutes. So, well, I better dig deep and get my two hundred dollar box because everyone else is. I mean, if this isn't fear of missing out at its finest, I don't know what is. Yeah. I mean, this is the exact scenario where you as a team collector or a player collector it, are, are in the, the best position ever because you're not wanting to go chase a 4X retail price for a sealed box that you don't know what you're going to get. You're going to be able to go and re, and buy the singles that you want for people who are trying to recoup you know, what they did. I mean, this should be a, a theoretical dream scenario for you, I think. Yeah. This is, oh, this is oh, oh. I'm going to wait on until December, January, and then try to go pick up some singles and kind of see where we are. Yeah, it, oh. it, it, it's... Sorry. I think the singles are going to be extremely high for the first 30 days because people are going to try to recoup that IRR, but it's not off that $50 price point. It's off the $179 price point. So they've got to sell them for $8 to $10 each. But I think at some point, you're going to have people that are just going to want to liquidate and cash out. Right. Could yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Tops didn't do anything wrong. I think a lot of people are upset that they didn't have an opportunity to buy it, and rightly so. But that's two separate arguments. And I think everybody's arguing it as if it were the same. Yeah. So for you, Ben, the lesson is patience, butterfly, patience. On this one, yes. It's so you don't need it. So real quick, yeah, if you were to buy if buy a box at fifty bucks each base card should be about a buck 50. So that means what 625 if they bought it for 200 bucks. Yeah, I mean you're looking at what 2 bucks would would put you at $64. Yeah. Um and then you you got your auto for free. Right? Yeah. And and that 2 bucks a piece. So yeah, you're you're it, it just really depends on how motivated people are. We, we spent a lot, a lot of time on a product that, that's sold out and it's overpriced at this point. Uh, but if you like coffee and donuts, this next product's for you. Uh, 2019 Upper Deck Tim Hortons Hockey dropped this week. Uh, in the past, it's been $0.99 cents a pack when you purchased a beverage or $2 for the pack by themselves. Uh, it's a one card or one pack, uh, but you're going to get three cards per pack. It's a 120-card base set. Autographs and relics are available um, in the packs. Uh, but they're in the form of redemptions, which is nice. Uh, but these are extremely tough pulls. So, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Tim Hortons, they serve breakfast, donuts, um, all kinds like of fun stuff. Uh, Piggly Wiggly, etc. Yeah, for us uh, on the West Coast, I guess it's most common to Dunkin' Donuts, maybe? That's a good comparison. So. Yeah. Uh, but it's got a cool name, so right off the bat, that's neat. Tim. Named after a player. And I just realized that I think – and, and give me – I just thought about this the other day when Tim Hortons – when I was reading about this, that in Wayne's World, they had Stan Makita donuts. I feel that's just a ripoff of Tim Hortons 
donuts because they were in Chicago. And it took me, what, 30 years to put that together. So, you know, I'm a smart one. Some people are, are a little slower than others. You'll get there. Yeah, but do you know who Tim Horton is? I have no clue, man. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Toronto, he loves Tim Hortons. And I, I also was quiet through that whole segment for a reason. Yeah. And so uh, we miss we miss that. We were hoping that once they merged with Burger King that we'd get a, little, a few more Tim Hortons here in the U.S., but the rollout seems to be going slow. Apparently, Americans um, aren't as crazy about Tim Hortons as Canadians are. I know um, there's a few in the Twin Cities area. Yeah, well, uh, New York, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, you know, those those border states, there's quite a few, but... Really, like, north of, like, what, Ohio and Kansas? We just consider that Canada South. <laughs> I mean, practically. Yeah. Uh, I hope you saved your pennies, fellas, because the next one's going to cost you a few. So, uh, 2019 Panini National Treasures Baseball drops Friday, $500 a box. One hey. pack per box, eight cards per pack. You're going to receive seven autos and or mem and one book card per box or per pack, however you want to look at it. Still, I don't see a checklist available. Yeah, there's a checklist out. Is there? Yeah. Um, this uh, was one of the first high-end products that got me back into the hobby in 2012. Like, seriously. I mean, I was already getting into it over the first two years of 10 and 11. But, man, these are hideous. <laughs> they are very, uh, yes, uh, white. Uh, rookie material signatures are a major chase. You're gonna have you're gonna have the juniors in there: Tatis and Guerrero, Eloy Jimenez rookies. New for 2019. There's three new insert or three new sets, I guess, inside subsets. Rookie silhouette threads, shadow, bo shadow box signatures, and treasured threads. Uh, there are retro signatures of all that are all hand signed. Some of those players that are retro in the sense that they were from the past, and they have legendary uh, material booklets. So. Uh, I think you're showing one there of, uh, was that Lou Gehrig? Lou Gehrig, yep. Yeah, some bat pieces. It looks like a jersey piece. Bat to jersey and a sock, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Hat. It's possible, yeah. Yeah. So people get upset with this product because they do chop up, they chop up, like, historical jerseys of players that, you know, played in the 30s. And, Understood. you know, that material is far and few between. I see that, but if it's the family that's selling it off and the company knowingly purchases it, no, I, it's their property. I know exactly. it's theirs. I'm just saying, people, but people get upset if you blow your nose the wrong way or you say hello sure. the wrong way. But it's the family's property and it's what they want to do. And you know, for most of these, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're not rebuying them on the secondary market to reuse. Not so much your, um, you know, Steve Garvey's, but your Babe Roots, your Lou Gehrig's, your Ted Williams's. Ted Williams' eye. Indeed. No, well, no, Ted Williams' head. Yes. Well, remember all that with him and John Henry and whatever. I was so weird. That just looked in. Uh, no, so, you know, that, that drops on. And also this weekend, or this Friday, 2019, Panini Illusion Football, Illusions Football drops. $150 a box, 10 packs per box, five cards per pack. You're going to receive in your box one autograph memorabilia card, one additional autograph, one autograph box topper, two mem cards, five inserts, three parallel inserts, and five base parallels. And a kitchen sink. Yes. So you're getting quite a bit. You're getting three autographs, a few mem, some parallels. Um, it's a hundred card base set. In the past, the, the base cards have come with a pair of players. This year, they reduced it to one, but they still use two images of the same player, and they kept the, the foil design. So it's got that foil board, which does look pretty sharp. Uh, they do offer four new parallel le parallel levels uh, pair. A current and that, that pair is a current player with a legend from the past. So I think John Elway and uh, Drew Lock Luck were Lock. Oh, I miss Andrew Luck. I'm sorry. Uh, were one of the ones they showed there, uh, Dwayne Haskins, and they showed this break. There you go. You got, there you go. Johnny yep. L. Johnny Elway and uh, good old Drew Locke. Um, autograph inserts are in the mix, uh, or a mix of rookie veterans, and they also use past themes uh, in the inserts, the autographs this year. So, pretty sharp looking set, shiny. Everybody likes shiny. 
Uh, what's brewing next week's release is 2019 Tops Archive Signature Series Retired Player Edition TTM is out. So we'll have a lot of fun with that. One of our favorite sets of the this, this releases is Archive Signatures Series. 50 bucks for a TTM looking like autograph in a encased. 2019 Panini Contenders Draft Picks Baseball. 2018-19 Panini Immaculate Basketball. I think that's one of the final basketball products of last year. And then 2019 Panini NFL 5 Trading Card Game drops, uh, which is a new thing. And so we'll talk about the trading card game. Sure. Back to what was that? Uh, that MLB Showdown? What's up? MLB Showdown? No, not that one. But before that, the, the CD one or whatever that Tops was. Attacks? No, way before. I'm talking like the early 90s. Yeah, anyway. I'll find it for oh, next week. Classic? No. No, no. It was, it was uh, no. I'll figure it out. Uh, infield chatter hobby talk section. Tops hockey has arrived. Kind of. Kind of. It looks like Tops is back. This is from our buddy Blowout Buzz on Twitter. It looks like Tops uh, hockey is Tops is back on the uh, NHL ice in 2019-2020 season. Tops NHL sticker, sticker collections out. So it releases on November 15th. We'll talk about it then. But we just wanted to give it a quick preview. There'll be a four. There will be four player sticker, uh, four player stickers per pack, along with one foil sticker. Um, in this release for the former uh, NHL card licensee, and then uh, the collection will include a whopping 629 stickers, mm. going in a 75 page album that includes uh, themes like teams, award winners, all stars, rookie debuts, puzzles, vintage teams, and the Stanley Cup playoffs. Stanley Cup playoffs. Vintage team stickers will revisit. Memorable logos of uh, of the past, while the hottest rookies from eighteen nineteen are in their sticker debuts, and that they're showing here a, a was a six sticker of the St. Louis Blues winning the cup. Yep, team photo there. Yeah, which maybe and- one day we'll have uh, this will lead to somebody else being able to to the multi licenses back to different to uh, you know other companies. I, I think each. I think each sport should have two companies that can make some sets, right? I just I, I don't. well, we talked about that before. Like, if if Tops could do five football and and Panini could do five baseball, I mean, yeah, I, I asked Tops this. Mike was sitting next to me, and I asked him. Yep. And uh, he looked at me and like was like, "Yeah, we, we, you know, that's that's not gonna happen." You know, yeah. Like, but, hey, hey, mom and dad, will you will you get undivorced? <laughs> It, it would be nice if they allowed that because it would allow us to. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, it, just, it makes me sad when I think about it. I mean, I don't know how you feel, Mike. Oh yeah, I agree. I I would be a big proponent of of multiple licenses again. Yeah, I, I think and the competition agree. is super good for the consumer, and, and it can be limited. You know, just let them have Don Rust and National Treasures and Immaculate, and and then Tops can do Tops Flagship and and Chrome and. And that's fair. We've already discussed it. If the market continues to strengthen, if the hobby continues to have the resurgence that we're seeing, I think there'll be enough proof that the market can sustain multiple companies having licenses. Now, maybe not multiple companies each cranking out 25 or 30 different releases per company, but um, I I think we're going to get there. A, a trade of three, three to five would be uh, fair. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. It's like keep them at the number that they're set at right now, but just skim a little off the top to go to one company and skim a little bit off of the other company and push it back over. And hey, you know, but you know, they can't get along even. We didn't even talk about the industry summit that happened last week. You know why? Upper Deck wasn't there. Tops wasn't there because they have they both do their own thing now. It's basically a Panini paid advertisement, and Leaf was there. So and Beckett, of course. Well, and Beckett, but yeah, because because Beckett owns the industry summit now, and um, it, it, so it's not really an industry summit if it's only one real major manufacturer, and then a guy down in Texas, you know, eating his ribs, hanging out. Um, what about me? No, that wasn't you, but Craig Ferris one tweeted out just pulled this at Upper Deck Sports, shaking. 
Could it be an auto? Maybe. Most relics are in packs. Either way, anything JFK is huge. Auto or Mystery Redemption would be massive, but if not, I'm still excited. And an upper deck tweeted back to him. Uh, it's not the auto, but it's for an inner piece from his briefcase. And here's what they look like. And they sent a picture of... Uh, it's a uh, one that was on sale on eBay. And this is kind of what the card will look like. It's a piece of JFK's briefcase. So naturally, they're a bit... And actually, they have a picture of the briefcase right there. Yeah. So naturally, they're a bit dejected. But still, that that's a huge piece. Yeah, I don't care. I mean, think about what that briefcase held in it at one point in time. Yeah. So no, that that's a pretty pretty sweet piece, and at six hundred bucks, you know, your first reaction is, well, that's that's expensive for a relic, but when you consider the historical significance, um, you know, and that's what it's being asked for. That doesn't necessarily mean that's what it's going to sell for. Yeah, I mean, anything presidential from any president that's that's no longer here, or for so long ago, or you know, he has such a story about him, right? You know, so. He's a little bit different than, say, some you know some of the other presidents we may have or have had. Spe speaking of Dallas, <sighs> um, all right, guys. Last year when we talked about this, Ben and I had a very heated discussion, which is passionate discussion about uh, about this vote on card number one for top for twenty twenty tops. Breaking news: voting for twenty twenty tops. Baseball card number one is now open. We need your help to decide which player should be card number one. Voting is open until September 30th at midnight Eastern, so 9 Pacific. There are 20 options covering 15 of the 30 major league teams. Run through them really quick. Acuna, Devers, Baez, Lindor, Arenado, Verlander, Trout, Bellinger, Kershaw, Yelich, Alonzo, DeGrom, Judge, Torres, Harper, Tatis Jr., Guerrero Jr., Scherzer, Soto, and then a write-in option. All right, Steph, who should be number one in 2020? So I'll tell you who should be. Tell real, quick, you. No, no, real quick, from the list. Uh, right, I'll tell you who should be from the who list. Write in. Who I wrote in. Okay. Uh, same as last year. But, um, no, if you're going to do it each year as a history of the previous year, I would have to go with uh, either Alonzo or Vladimir Guerrero. One, because of what they've done at, at such a young age and just putting um, exclamation points off to a start of a great year, uh, career, rather. Um, they'd, they'd make you a great number one. And they're not a Yankee or a Dodger, so nah, go with them. Who I wrote in, uh, Bartolo Colon, like I have the last three, four times they've done this contest. Well, it's just a waste of a vote. He's striking out minor or little leaguers down in wherever he was. Uh, yeah, but he's striking them out. So he's he, having success. He uh, could be. He could pitch for the A's. Probably not this year. Not on that staff. And and and, and I'd it's like to see. You, you, the, the the poor intern who has to flip through everyone's entries and then they see Bartolo Colon written in twice. Mike, who uh, are you picking, bud? I think I'd go with Acuna. Who would be your write-in vote? Who would be my write-in vote? I like from chat, Albert Pujols. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would, would be happy with four or five of the guys that are already on the list. All right, Ben. Who's from the list are you selecting? Speaking of pull holes, he tied Ty Cobb for fifth all time in total bases tonight. Nice. Uh, congratulations. I like that call too. I think pull holes would be a good one to kind of uh, honor his career. Um, for me, it only came down to four of the guys on the list that I think are worthy. And that was Verlander, Trout, Scherzer, or Kershaw because they, they're veteran players. Uh, sure. Who I voted for was Verlander because he's going to be the Cy Young this year. And, um, I mean, he's the best pitcher we've seen since Martinez. Um, and then I wrote in Marcus Simeon, the 2019 AL MVP. They haven't even clinched yet. If he I wins, if, he, if Simeon wins the MVP, I will buy you 
all of your A's team sets from Topps flagship Chrome, Allen and Genser and Gypsy Queen next year. Here you can just buy me the Sapphire. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll buy you the Sapphire set if he makes if he wins the LMVP. Or or you can buy me my my twenty uh, or nineteen eighty five. ACO Donald Trump that I tweeted out today. I don't know if you guys saw that, but that was hilarious. Um, mm. I from from this list, I would pick uh, Mike Trout. It should be Mike Trout every year until he retires. Um, but my write-in vote would be the 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 ni- 2019 World Series champions, like they did in the 60s and 70s, and that should be it. That should be the the card number one, or, forever, forever, or. And I know that someone here on the podcast tonight said, well, let's save for that for Heritage, which is, you know, they, they copy what, what they did in the past. Or go back to the league leaders being the first nine cards where you had the sure. home, the American League home run leader and the National League home run leader, and it's a big picture of their noggins. Nice. And it says 19, 2019 home run champions, AL, NL, and on the back it lists the top, whatever, 10 from each, each league. Go back to that. That's cool. Or even in the 80s where they did the record breakers. Sure. What nine records got broken this year that were cool. Home run record, there? Sure. I, I just think having a player there sometimes, um, eh, I don't know. But I don't, it, you know, if you're going to list 15 or you're going to list 20 guys, uh, why not just list one from each team? Just like the all star, like, hey, everybody, from, you know, but, you know, it's not going to be that's that. What we, that's, that was what I argued about last year, and everybody was giving me a hard time. They're like, well, I think it was you that said, oh, a trophy. Everybody yeah. gets a trophy. And it's like, but why have twenty it's options? A, it's ridiculous. Twenty. There, it's if you if they think it's such a high honor, it, it should be like what five or eight guys. Yeah, right? no, it, it should be a couple of veterans and a couple of you know. I, I I like Mike's point about you you know if it's a reflection of the last year, okay, then you can have Alonzo and Guerrero. You could have Verlander and Garrett Cole, um, and then you could have you know Mike Trout because he's Mike Trout. But, yeah. but my thing is, it, it it's like when you when you're talking to trade with somebody and they're like, I collect, and it, this is looks like the list of the guys they they PC, like it's all of the big names in the baseball, you know? Yeah, no, it's like, oh, okay, well, the yeah. the list didn't surprise me this year. I knew there wouldn't be an A on there for me to select, um, and I also knew that that the the previous year's world series champion wasn't going to be on there before I even looked at the list. I'm like, neither of those are going to be on there. So at, um, design on deck on Twitter, Ross said, I see tap still has no clue how to properly crop photos for cards. Uh, which I thought was interesting. There's just the way that some of the cards they showed were, you know, um, so I asked Nick Wasika, our buddy who actually has photographs used in tops cards tops. Now he has, uh, the, the Beckett last month that with the judge on the cover, that's his photo. And he said, there's five things level your horizon lines, give a moving subject somewhere to go in the frame, never crop at a joint. I want to see both hand. I want to see hands, both of them. And then C flaps are to baseball as what white face masks are to amateur hockey brutal <laughs> photography or photographically speaking. So I, I don't have a problem with that Guerrero the, to, to me. There's nothing wrong with that one. Yeah. I mean, but see how they put Acuna's hand over it, it's it, the, the name plates behind the hand and the hand comes out. Why couldn't they have done that with Guerrero with his foot and with his hand? And why is Kershaw zoomed in so much? The top of his glove is missing. You mean they couldn't pull that back a little bit and crop that differently so you got his full glove? Or DeGrom? No, it, or DeGrom? No, they, it, it, they're all good points. I mean, the Guerrero, I don't really have a problem with, but the consistency as well. If, if it's either going to go, the picture's either going to go over the border or under it, it needs to be that way for any card, you yeah, know, any five different bit. people. Each, each per, there were five different people that worked on these. And yeah. they both had different understandings of what they needed to have done. I don't, I don't know. It just, you know, it, they're not going to change anything because they don't need to. They're not going to, you know, whatever. But it's going to sell anyway. We're still going to go buy them. And my next thing's where our next thing talks about this. But Mike, what do you feel on the on the on the photo cropping? Yeah, I don't know. I like when they 
like the Acuna I like. Um, I also agree, Ben. I don't really have a problem with the Guerrero. Um, I, I'm not sure. It, it'd be it, it's a good topic. I'd love to hear what the logic is if they have a method to their madness on <laughs> how they crop the photos that they crop. You know, um, maybe they're cropping them this way so that they can use the same photo with a slightly different view on eight different other releases throughout the rest of next year, and it doesn't look exactly the same. Um, it'd be interesting to hear kind of why they choose to crop them the way they crop them. So on the topic of cropping, here's an interesting one that popped up at work. Check this out. And then check this out. Look at the top of his hat. Yeah, this, the space between the... Yeah, that's also with uh, Greg Jeffries that year, too. Yeah, I think it's the majority of the future stars, but th th that's what they're talking about. You know, you, you should be able... Personally, I wish they'd pull out like 1973 tops ish photography where it's a little bit more zoomed out. And you can actually see the action, not just, oh, pitcher wind up, oh, post swing, middle of throwing the ball. Yeah. And it's better than some of the stuff from the mid 80s where it was, you could tell it was just all from spring training. Right. You know, so that's better. So I ran a poll. I put out a, a flagship poll and I asked, there's 111 votes and it was only ran it for a day. I said, flagship, I collect. Because I put tradition, hot rookies, I don't, and others. Four uh, percent came back and said others. Twenty-one percent said I don't. Fourteen percent said hot rookies, and sixty-two percent uh, responding said tradition. Uh, Drew Smalley said because it's the first baseball product out, and I'm usually Jonesin, and I, I feel the same way. Um, you know, it's February. You're excited. Baseball's coming. You got that this uh, year. offspring's response with the Dave Chappelle, uh, Ed. Tw tweeted back, I'm a fool. OMC Bo, um, 1 million cards, Bo said, it's the first release of the new season. And then the Schlobot Sh Schlobotnik. Schlobotnik reports said, flagship, because I like sets with relatively deep checklist tops because collector's choice and Fleer tradition no longer options. Solid commentary. So what, what best fits you guys as far as why you collect flagship if you do? Uh, tradition. I mean, w with the National knocking off the last of the Twins, I'm going to keep collecting each year as they release. Um, and no, like I was saying, this year especially – this upcoming year where we're going to have to bust out either new binders or new dividers to write 2020 or new box because it's the start of a decade, a new decade. Um, and uh, uh, what, what else are you going to do? You, you're going to stop just because it's a brand new year. No, you're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Like the junkie you are. Once a cup, technically tops living. Living is the first card of the year. Yeah. Well, eh, true. Pack, we're talking packs, though. Uh, so, Mike, where do you fall? For me, I think it's. It, I like that historical comment. I really like the fact that flagships got seven hundred cards. Um, but between that and and if you add on update at the end, and you put together that whole set. Um, you, you've pretty much got a record of, of the majority of big league players from that season. And that's what appeals to me still as a set collector, building that set, having that record of, of who was there. And the, the checklist is deep enough that you're going to get some pretty obscure names at the end of the day. So that, that's the, the primary reason I go after that one. Yeah. Benjamin. So there, there's a, a gif of Matthew McConaughey. Yep. And I, I think it's her. I think it's from Dallas Buyers Club, the the GIF, and it's I need it. You know, he's a drug addict. I mean, this is our drug for more or less, at least mine, right? I, the reason I, I collect it is because I need it. I don't have it yet. It's new. It's the next thing. It's plain and simple. Yeah, if I could only collect one set, I know I said earlier on the show it would be Stadium Club or Gypsy or Sapphire. I mean, flagship, of course. I, I suppose it has to be flagship because, you know, that that's what I am predominantly as a team set collector, but I need it. It's a drug. We're it's the sickness. It's the disease. So, so since you mentioned it and completely 
completely off topic, but sharing screen here. There's a scene at the end of Dallas Buyers Club where they're actually going to court and discussing uh, the case. However, the guy on the far right here went to high school with me. He was in my ninth grade science class. Uh, helped me toy around with computers. Helped me toy around with cards. Uh, good friend. So That's crazy. That's unrelated. Uh, he the more like you know. Yeah, he. You know what? He real quick glance at that guy. He looked like Napoleon Dynamite's brother. Uh, we both I thought that's who it was. was. So, <laughs> uh, my thing is is, is tradition. It, it, like Mike said, it gives you the history uh, of that season. Uh, it, it's like Sports Center used to be. Mm-hmm. So when they first created Sports Center, their goal was to re- record that day's events in sports and report it to so somebody could go back and use it like a resource to go back and say hey on september 10th 1984 what was that sports day like and it set that day aside from and the sports center is almost not that way anymore and it's sad to me but that's what tops flagship is, is this is what the set look this is what the players look like this is what the uniforms look like you know and you go back and, you, and sometimes you go back through these old sets if you're calling cards and you go like hell, I didn't know Conseco was a was an expo, right? You know, there's a picture of him there in an expo's uniform, or like I didn't know that Rod Crew was a twin. I've only seen him as an angel. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I, I knew Conseco was an expo. Got a poster of that in my bedroom, but you're, you're, no way Rod Carew was ever a twin. Did you know that, that Ken Hurt or that uh, Carmen Killebrew was a twin? I thought he was just a royal. For a- like- A's and Royal Legend. That's right. That, that's right. I thought I heard something about that, but I, I thought it was uh, Senators, right? Not Twins. Yeah. Gotcha. Couple years okay. Ago. So, Steph, you sent this over, this thing with warranty stickers. I what did. Was, what the hell was that? Uh, let me pull this up here. Boop, 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 boop. So I, I, this initially came up because I saw someone list uh, Juan Soto, um, Tops, Target, the retail uh, exclusive. Uh, the, pink, the pinks especially. These have a slight premium over the regular Chrome cards for obvious reasons. And, and for those that are not watching the, 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 the podcast um, and just listening, it's in a – what are those, those uh, card savers? Mm-hmm. A silver sticker across where you would insert the card that says or warranty remove warranty voided if removed. Uh, there's a serial bar, a serial bar there, like a scan bar, and then the number, and then like you see in the little back, it says genuine, authentic, kind of like in foil. Right. So, go ahead. So my my issue um, with this is that initially. Uh, uh, what, what, the whole reason I was even looking these up was that apparently, speaking of cropping, uh, there are versions where the Walgreens logo here in the corner is slightly more to the left. And these that have the full Walgreens logo sl- have a slight premium over the regulars. But the picture itself caught me off guard because, okay, so you see these every now and then, uh, particularly a certain seller from New Jersey. He'll ship you your cards and it'll have a warranty void if removed. Now, I can understand if you, you're you buying like a food product or something that spoils after a certain date or uh, like shampoo, so, uh, home goods. But for a card, um, well, one, the eBay auctions, uh, they'll, they'll take the purchaser side regardless so the stickers moot point but i thought it was interesting and i thought it was worth discussing you know w- what do you guys think about a seller putting those on their card and in particular i'd like to hear mike's opinion yeah the first thing that i was going to is i think it's the seller's attempt to minimize their risk of somebody swapping out a card for something that has a ding or a damaged um corner or something else to say hey i sent this card it was sealed um if that seal's broken the the buyer swapped that out 
Um, I, I don't know what the what eBay is going to do. I know typically they're going to side with the 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 buyer on most situations, but I don't know if that helps them win a few more cases than it would before. It's probably worth doing. I don't have a problem with it. You know, it's an extra what five or ten cents probably for for the seller to to stick that on there, and if it can avoid them a few headaches. Um, maybe it's worth it. I don't have a problem with it. That that may be the only. Yeah, that that was my argument. I, I agree with Mike like a hundred percent on that. It's uh, yeah. To me, it's just the seller can say, "Hey, listen, this is the condition I sent the card in. That sticker is removed, so therefore I can't guarantee that's the card they actually sent them, or they didn't pull it out of the top loader and then drop it on the ground and hmm. dig the corner." So. I just thought it was interesting the way, you know, when you sent that over and, sure. uh, you know, the card. So it uh, kind of brings us up to this next thing. So at Grand, only at Grand Slam, um, tweeted out this. A customer opened a baseball card exchange, uh, authenticated 1984 Donruss box, and had a wax pack with no cards and one puzzle piece. Uh, the box did have had the matting, lane, just never seen a pack with zero cards in it. And here's a picture of what it looked like. So, I mean, they, they go in and it's just... And it looks like a sealed wax pack. Now, you know, we talked about this before the show that, you know, that definitely could have happened. I mean, the the Q, the quality control back in the 80s was, especially with like Donneris and Fleer, was not the best. Yeah. But it, it looks like a Donneris pack that's on a diet. <laughs> you know, it's super thin. But my thing is, is that, you know, the way that baseball card exchange goes through this, and I mean, really, they do a, a good job with guaranteeing the authenticity of your box, you know, sure. that's not been tampered with. Um, we did hear at the national a couple of things. So they have two versions of their authentication process. One is, is they'll authenticate the box as it's full of the X number of packs in that box that are from that year that have not been tampered with. Meaning that all of those packs may not have originated in that same box. It could have been a, Frankenstein box of a few different boxes put into one. And then they have one that they list as from a sealed case, which means the box was removed from a sealed case and then sealed up and and um, guaranteed or you know authenticated by them. Right. I just want to know what your guys' thoughts were, not necessarily on this. It just kind of brought up the topic of the authentication process of allowing a like a Frankenstein box and then also having one of a, from a sealed case, what your thoughts were, if it matters at all. Ben. Yeah, no, I suppose it depends on what I'm paying for it. Right. You and I were at a show uh, a couple months back, six months ago, whatever it was and bought that 87 tops box, mm -hmm. which we knew was Frankenstein box. And we didn't get any of the big name players. I think the the biggest name we pulled out of there was maybe a Barry Larkin or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, but if you're paying, you know, a quarter, 50 cents a pack, all right. And it, it was the fun of the rip. But if I'm buying something from, from the exchange, I'm buying it because I'm looking either to piece together a mint set or I'm looking for cards that are going to be as close to mint as possible that I can grade. And getting a Frankenstein box, like you said, well, it had the Mattingly in it. Okay, well, that's good. I would hope so, or at least, you know, a good chance at it. I'd be a little upset if, you know, that 87 Tops box that we had bought was authenticated. And then we get nothing. No Maguire, no Canseco, no Bonds. Uh, you know, you know, you know none say that, that we pulled just the Larkin. Out of all those guys you just named, you had Will Clark, Bo Jackson into that, Barry Bonds. None of those guys in the Hall of Fame, but Larkin is. And he's like, wow. eh, just Barry Larkin. Yeah. No, but 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 if you're if you're naming the top 10 cards out of that pack, Larkin, or you know, out of that box, out of that set, Larkin would be on that top 10 most likely. Um, he was the only one. What I'm saying is out of a full box, you would assume that you're gonna get a handful of them. Yeah. You know, and, and I would be upset if I bought something, but if if I paid you know, 30 cents on the dollar for the Frankenstein box versus factory sealed, then, then the, the variable in the, the, the discussion changes a little bit. Yeah. Like that box of rack pack, 87 racks pack I bought from the same show. 
is fully loaded where it shows uh, all those stars on the front or back somewhere. And we lost Ben. Hopefully he'll pop back in. Um, Mike, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't know enough about what type, like you said, there's multiple types of authentication that they do. You know, if, if that was from a sealed case and authenticated from a sealed case, uh, I'm not sure it, it's, I mean, that sounds like a, a pack out issue, right? If it was um, one that they theoretically had thumbed through or whatever that they had done to validate just that it has the right number of packs in it, you would have thought that's something that they would have caught. Yeah. In theory. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. I don't know how my stream dropped. Uh, Mike, let's, let's talk about your latest post. So, or one of the latest ones. Uh, last week you posted uh, cardboard gold. What baseball cards taught me uh, about business? Tell us a little about the post and, and what made you decide to write it. Yeah, it was something that I had been kind of thinking about, you know, for a little while. Um, despite some hosts' uh, assertion that it seems like you either have to be all hobby or all business when it comes to cards. I've got that blend where um, it's primarily a hobby, but there's a business aspect to it um, that I really enjoy as well. Um, and as I, over the last couple of years, have been starting to, or continuing to buy and sell and um, try to build the, the blog and the website and the, the different things that come through that, um, I saw a lot, or I saw more and more overlap um, from my day job and some of the leadership and business concepts that I use in my day job to some of the things that were helping me find success um, selling carts. And yes. um, so I thought it'd be a, a good topic to write about. Um, one of the other things was I've also been trying to figure out how can I um, start to engage a little bit more in, in LinkedIn um, from a content perspective. And so um, I thought this would also be a good topic to um, start that kind of LinkedIn integration and starting to see uh, if I can build any traction or an audience on LinkedIn. Um, and so uh, th this, had a, this topic had a little bit of overlap between um, both collecting and business. And so I thought I'd, I'd give it a shot and see what happens. Yeah, you had three major topics in there. Uh, you talked about success comes when you're willing to do what others aren't, seeing, see the big picture, and attention wins. Can you just kind of, like, give us a brief cap, like, on all three of those, kind of, like, where you picked up, um, like, what the, like, the key point is from one of those and where we can also consume this article? Yeah, so the first one, doing what others aren't, um, I think that's been probably one of the biggest um, opportunities of success for me since I got back into the hobby. Um, in, in our, in my local situation, as I, when I started collecting again, the LCS owner um, here in town is, is much more focused on hits and those bigger cards. Um, and there's a pretty big customer base here. That's also focused on those hits and bigger cards and so me wanting to build a collection with uh, base sets and other things, I was able to pick up um, base and inserts super cheap. And so some of these first collections that I bought were all base and inserts and took a lot of sorting. Um, but when I found Sport Lots and when I found ComC and some of these other platforms to sell, um, even when I started setting up at shows, um, I was able to turn by taking the time to sort through all of that stuff. I was able to sell it on sport lots um, by putting together base um, collections or, or grouping base stars um, and put them in my quarter box or my dollar box. I found an, a, a customer base for those at the shows I'm setting up to. Um, and a lot of people I found aren't willing to take the time to sort through and go through all that stuff. And so um, by putting in a little work that opened up um, a whole market for me to be able to sell to that um, my LCS doesn't want to mess with. And a lot of the other um, dealers that I know around around here don't even want to, to take the time to mess with. And so 
um, that was kind of the impetus of, of that one. Um, as far as seeing the big picture, you know, I think there's a, a couple things there too. You know, I, I have other friends who they want to buy the newest thing and they want to buy it as soon as it comes out and they don't want to think through anything in advance of that. And so one of the things that I wanted to do to try to save money was, was pre-ordering. And when I was pre-ordering through my LCS, I was able to, to lock in um, new product at sometimes 50 to 60% of the release price, um, which goes a long way to, to offsetting your cost or helping you uh, recoup your cost if you're looking to sell. And, and it goes a long way to minimizing um, the cost of collecting if you're just looking to, to buy and hold and, and build your own collection. And so um, by, by stepping back a little bit and planning ahead, um, that was something that helped me um, buy things at a, at a lower cost to, to make a little more later on or to, to collect at a lower cost. Um, and then the other big piece was um, when Sport Lots introduced the, the box shipping option, um, they kind of laid out that, hey, if you offer a big box shipping option, um, you, there's going to be an advantage to where your listings fall in the list of, of cards that are available. Uh, and a lot of people are thinking, no, I'm not going to give up that 50 cents or that dollar uh, shipping charge, you know, for every one of these orders. Um, but I kind of tried to take a step back and look and say, hey, I'm going to test this out and see because I have a hunch that box orders are only going to be some percent. But when my listings go to the top of of all of the cards available for every order regardless of whether it's a box order or not i think that's going to generate a whole lot more sales um, in the big picture than it is for me to miss out on a few dollars here and there in, in shipping charges and that's paid off in the end and even though it's been a year plus uh, where that's been an option there's still people who refuse to um to to give a discounted shipping option uh, when it comes to those box orders. And so I think they're a little short-sighted in seeing what might be out there. Um, so sometimes those short-term hits um, make you miss out on on the bigger, longer-term opportunity. And then the last one was attention wins. Um, you know, whether it's back to that whole point of getting to the top of the list on my, my sport lots listings, or whether it's where I set up at the show and which table um, I continue to, to set up at to get the most um, eyes on my table as, as customers walk in the door. Um, getting that attention is, is key. Um, so both in card, both on sport lots, both on uh, the blog or, or podcast or show or whatever you're doing, um, getting people's eyeballs on uh, what you're trying to share is, is foundational to long-term success. No, definitely. And uh, you get a pretty good response. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's been some, some pretty good response. Um, you know, some people reaching out direct, um, commenting on the, the post, commenting on Twitter, um, had, a, had a, a few people or quite a few people retweet it. Um, it it's been it's been a it's been neat to see. I, I like having those topics that have a little bit of a a crossover between not just the, the card world, but um, generate a little bit of conversation um, kind of in the, in the rest of the, the real world or the rest of the world or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well. And it's also evergreen topic too. So um, you can catch Mike at uh, wax pack hero and uh, you're writing pretty, pretty frequently on there, right? You're posting like at least you're posting at least something once a week, if not more frequently. Is that correct? Yeah, usually at, at least once a week, um, if not twice a week. Um, usually I try to get something out there every four to five days. Um, usually ends up being seven or eight um, posts a month. Um, and so that, that's kind of the, the cycle that I put on. Usually try to have a mix of kind of set reviews, some of these evergreen topics, um, as well as you know just some uh, top lists or uh, – recapping a collection that i bought or something like that it's always good so check it out uh, you can also to subscribe and, and and then you get little notifications um if you don't follow on twitter uh when you get a little email to say hey there's a new post go check it out so yep. um 
so I came across this guy. I'm not sure how familiar anybody is with him, but his it was a YouTube page, and instantly I thought of Ben and how Ben and this guy should have a show together. But his his YouTube name is Sports Card Investor. And uh, so I watched this video because it said, warning, my worst wheel tail box ever is episode 11. And it had like a couple thousand, almost a couple thousand reviews or views at this point. And the, the little subject of the said of it said, for the past two weeks, Target.com has been selling this box and it's sold out on multiple times. Some Walmarts and Targets now have it out on their shelves, but it's going quick. I thought I was lucky when I got a bunch. Turns out I wasn't. This is a scary story you need to hear. So this gentleman um, purchased 40 blaster boxes <laughs> of 2019-20 Panini Contenders draft pick basketball uh, at $20 a piece, so an $800 purchase. And now he's showing a video where he's opening it with his 8-year-old son and um, and in those blasters, you're guaranteed on the box that says one autograph per box, quote, on average. They opened up 20 blasters, and then he stops his son and him from opening these blasters. They, Out of the 20 blasters, they had 10 Panini points in replacement of the autographs. <laughs> and they mostly were 150 points. The autographs that they showed were players that were in college basketball that I'd never heard of that aren't on an NBA team. They were just collegiate basketball players. They had signed cards. They pulled a Zion almost every pack or every box. And he questions, and, and I want to run this through you guys. First off, um, he goes, is this the start of overproduction where Panini promises an autograph <laughs> every, of every, pa- every box, but they can't even come through with base autos of guys that didn't make the NBA, so they have to replace it with points. And but my thing is, is it just a crap product? Because real quick, collegiate releases have a, I would say, a very short time window, especially something like this in basketball, where yeah, it's the first one, and we're all excited. But multiple basketball releases are on the horizon, and um, so real quick, Steph, do you think this is the start of overproduction on this? based on what this product produced so far for this gentleman? I mean, it sounds like he said he said that they keep selling out and there's an, there's apparently a demand for it. Um, I, I would agree that um, you know some of these companies are trying to rush out products that match the key hot rookie for that year or someone starts heating up in uh, the beginning of the season they start pushing that player towards the end in all of their products. And you see that a lot, especially in basketball and hockey and, uh, sorry, screen fl- uh, fl- flickered on me. Um, I'm still here, right? Yes, you're here. Okay. Okay. There it goes. All right. I'm, I'm back. I'm back. 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 Um, no, it, it seems like um, that they, 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 they definitely do seem to rush out some of these products, and which means, unfortunately, that some of them are kind of crap products. Um we see it uh, like so, some of the, especially the collegiate stuff, but also some of the minor league team stuff, the um, not the major sellers, if you will. And it seems like they're almost pushing it out just to attempt to meet a demand that may or may not be there. That makes any sense. Yeah. Well, and I agree. Uh, Mike, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, cause real quick in like retail, and a lot of people go, and they, they, we've talked about this, and I've talked about this a lot on Twitter, where people go and buy retail, and they expect that they're going to find the greatest card ever in there, which inherently is not true because it retails most likely just going to be some base and insert cards, and that's what you should expect going into it. This guaranteeing the autograph, you would think that a majority of the boxes would have autographs and not points but what are your thoughts on the overproduction and and what this guy's experience was yeah i think you you know i i think retail is a place i'm a supporter of of retail um as long as you go into it knowing you know what you're getting you know you guys have talked about that in the past when it comes to this i think yeah i think the points are because um the demand for this year's 
contenders draft was higher than what Panini expected, but they still wanted to get stuff out in retail. And so they replaced a bunch of the autos with points. Um, if you bought contenders draft or even or contenders draft basketball or football, and we're only expecting people who actually got drafted, then you're going to be mistaken because contenders draft basketball with the draft being only a couple rounds, it's, it's always had a bunch of, college graduates who may or may not ever play in the NBA. That's just what it is. And so it doesn't surprise me that, that the retail product is going to be filled with more of, of those caliber players. Cause heck, even the hobby is filled with more of those caliber players than they have before. That's not new for contender draft basketball or contender draft football. So, no. um, that's just what contenders is. And that's why contenders should only be a hundred or $125 product and not what it's being being bumped up to um this year because the chances of getting any of those um high draft picks are so small because it's filled with all of these other other players yeah and i i talked to my lcs about this and how the boxes were one you know panini valued them at 130 dollars because that's what, right. where they had to be well you know when boxes are going for 200 plus say up to even 300 a box people are a lot of people are going to get crushed for sure and uh one of the guys that works there put a few said he put a he bought a couple boxes um he works the shop so he's fully not he doesn't receive a check so he he gets taking care right. of kind of volunteer product you know and, and he gets sure. discounts right and so he put a couple boxes aside he sold some and he's just like he was told by the, the owner hey, don't open this Cause you're going to get destroyed. Oh yeah. Um, you know, if you get lucky enough to pull the Zion, awesome, but you're going to have a very small window to sell it. And if you try to grade it and then get it back and sell it, you, you know, you're going to, your time frame is very short as hoops drops in a, a month. Um, right. You know, the list price of hoops is $80 a box, but they're already pre-selling at like 150. And you go back and look right. at hoops the last couple of years. Currently, you can pick up a 17, 18 box of hoops or an 18, 19 box of hoops for under 80 bucks at this point. And they're pre selling it. They're, people are pre selling them at $150, which is almost 2x right. of the list price. Which is where I was going to ask uh, with what Mike was saying, you know, at what point should we as collectors expect? a better result out of the box because you know, no, no offense to this company, but there's a company that produces some collegiate football products and some of them are great. Some of them are nice and they fit a niche market. However, you know, you'll get like the third string defensive back as an autograph <laughs> and no offense to that guy. And Hey, congrats. You got a card, but um, you, you know, not everyone wants the place kickers autograph. Well, well, to me, it's so many people are, especially the collegiate stuff, usually because it comes out between when the draft happened in any sport and when the season's right. about to start. Yeah. So we're so, I think so many collectors, one have the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out. They're so addicted to, having to have that new product and that new the new crop coming in, they're willing at retail to buy anything. And so that's the that's my question is if they go and they buy this stuff and I know what you're talking about. It's it's like I was watching an episode of Shameless and Frank the guy <laughs> said he was willing to drink the spilled beer that was right. off. William H. Mason didn't have enough money to buy a regular beer. Yeah, you know, I'll drink all the 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 you know the pour outs and all that stuff. I don't care what it is. I'm so desperate for it. I need it, and that's how I feel. Sometimes collectors are with some of the stuff at retail. Is they see it and they go, "I have to have it. It's only twenty bucks. I'll buy four boxes. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna be awesome. This is gonna be the best eighty dollars I ever spent." And they get destroyed. Expect. Don't expect the unexpected. Expect what should happen. You know, it's. Right, and that's the thing. And this guy, you know, hey, listen, I I understand he's investing in cards, and he talks about some other stuff, uh, in in the video a little bit. But this right here is just off the bat, not the best product to dive into like this. And I think his a uh, 
what his expectations were versus what the product was um, were disappointing. But to me, what he got was pretty spot on, except for I would expect the autographs to be a little more than 50%. Um, sure. So It cracks me up because you said that he and I should collaborate. He's told me we should. Oh, I've really? blasted, This guy is an absolute clown. I've blasted this guy for weeks. Every time the topic of investing comes up, somehow he ends up seeing it and he ends up talking and, and he comes across as this expert and, and myself along with other people who are like-minded have absolutely destroyed this guy, this guy. And, and to Mike's point earlier, I don't have any problem with anybody making this a self-sustaining hobby or business. There is a, a stark difference between what Mike does and what an investor attempts to do. Because you're speculating at that point. You're making it a day trading operation, not a self-sustaining hobby as Mike has done. And so it's not one in the same. And, and there's plenty of room to make it a business. People are on the distribution side. People are, are have brick and mortars. People set up at shows. There's a difference between buying a collection and selling it um, because other people aren't willing to put in that effort as Mike has and, and showed has shown he can make it sustainable. The difference is when people are, I'm, I'm going to go buy a bunch of Daniel Jones rookies at five bucks each. And I'm going to try to sell them for $10 each. And, and then people are buying them at $10 each, hoping that they're going to sell for 15. But the issue is on that particular card, the cap is seven or eight and you already spent, you know, 10. There's just no more room, no more meat on the bone, or at least not enough. And that's why I have an issue with investing. This guy has come across time and time again in conversations as a so-called expert. And then he buys all of that contenders and it just makes me laugh. Yeah. Because it's like, I thought you were an expert because if you were an expert, you wouldn't have bought that. For, for what it's worth, I have watched his show and um, I saw his interview on another podcast and, and I enjoyed it. And, and even though the speculating aspect is not the way my, my preferred method of collecting or my preferred method of trying to, to generate a self-sustaining hobby. Um, I prefer to go a, a little more of a, a safe grinded out route to do that. Um, there's still things that I learned from, from his show and from the, the other podcasts that, that he was in, a guest on. And so I personally, I'd stop short of calling him, calling him a clown just because it's not the way that I, um, prefer to collect. I, I still got something out of of that, um, but yeah, I you know it, it's definitely a, a different approach um, to, to buy and hold. But hey, if that's how somebody else wants to collect, if they want to try to think that they can prospect um, and and identify who that next uh, starting QB is going to be or who that next minor league superstar is going to be, um, I guess more power to them. I, I think but a lot more risk. Um, than it, than I'm willing to take, you know. Well, I, I think if you're an investor like that guy and you're trying to make money by buying in bulk or doing something like that, a better way to do it would be to invest in, into someone that's actually living and breathing the hobby. Rather, it be a, a guy that runs an LCS and you're a financial backer. Rather, it's Mike. And this guy, this guy becomes Mike's, uh, you know, basically, sh you know, shark, and comes in and says, "Hey, Mike, I want to invest in the Mike. I want to invest in Wax Pack Hero, and here's ten thousand dollars. Go do what you're currently doing. Just do it on a bigger level. And if we make money off that ten thousand, the next month I'm going to give you twenty thousand. That way you can go out and you're going to hire cut two people. That's what uh, uh, I think." If you're, an, you're a smart investor, you would do is you would take somebody that's already very successful in, in the hobby and partner up with them and be the money to the brains. See, right? But Just because you have is, money doesn't mean you have brains. See, but that's investing. That is actually the definition of investing. Yeah. And, and, and our friend Colin at Sports Talk Radio had mentioned that today. That's investing. What people are doing today is day trading. If they're sitting on these cards for seconds, not months. When you when you buy a stock, the idea is I'm buying into Amazon uh, and, and I'm going to sit on it for months, if not years, and watch my portfolio grow 
knowing that that I've got that money sitting there that I can cash out at a later date. What yeah. people are doing today is they're buying penny stocks, hoping that they turn into dollar stocks, but they're not paying pennies. They're paying tens and twenties of dollars, hoping I'm, tr- I'm trying to turn a $20 bill into a $30 bill. Real quick. And- I, 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 yeah, I get I on that. And it's going to tie in this next subject. And uh, Zach Grinke just has a no hitter going right now. With but to, 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 to my point, had, had. I, 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 I've listened to that guy time and time again, and I've got a welt here from banging my head on my desk. And, and my hands are red from slapping the table because it's just like, you've got to be kidding me. The stuff that that guy says is like, nobody can be listening to that guy and taking him serious. I mean, I, I've gotten into conversation after conversation with him and everything he says is just bass backwards. But that's just me. Yeah, I mean, it ties into the the... the- the, the tweet yesterday from Chris Stuber where he said buying sports cards, specifically the right cards of the right player is the closest thing to owning stock and your favorite athlete. And you and I disagreed on this, Ben sport, you know, Colin from sports card radio came out and said, I've spent over half my life buying and s- buying, selling uh, stocks and cards. There's no compare. Is, what is Tim roboting for anyone else? Or is it just me? Yeah. He sounded a little, a little robot there for a second. So, um, you're right. We good. Sounds okay. Yeah, I think it's just you. It yeah. sounds good to me. So he said, yeah. I've spent over half of my life buying, selling stocks and cards. There's no comparison. It's way harder to make money selling cards. You guys should put them down sometime, make money the easy way. So Ben and I kind of disagreed on this where I said, you know, buying, buying sports cards is, can be similar to, to buying toning stock and your favorite athletes, meaning that when you, if you buy a Mike Trout or say, well, let's do this. If you buy a, an Alex Bregman card, right. And then he goes out and he has a great game and you bought that rookie card at say $5. He goes out and he has a great postseason. The Astros win the world series. He ends up being the MVP of the world series. And, all of a sudden, now he's got this major stage and he's got a couple World Series rings. You know, that $5 rookie card might be worth $10 and you're excited because, hey, you know what? I'm an Alex Bregman fan. And now that card buy for $5 is more, is worth more money technically if you were to sell at that point in time. And it's similar to like, I like wearing Nike shoes. I buy stock in the company because I think they're a good company. I enjoy that. They're, you know, whatever. It's not really the, I mean, I was going on just a very basic fact that it can't. You can look at it as being a similar thing. It's not because Ben said humans aren't commodities, where companies are, but the card is the commodity that's kind of controlled by the human that's on the card, and the companies are controlled by humans to make them more profitable or successful. So it's just is, cardboard. I can see where he's coming from. It's just I cardboard. Understand. But, but, and, and that's the thing but, is, is you can't compare a Mike Trout rookie has card. Value, then, why, then, then why do we have then why do we care about what a card is worth when we pay money for it? The why only person that cares about it, the only person that cares about it, is the buyer and seller. Here's the thing: I've got binder after binder after binder that I could care less what they're worth because I collect them. But you, I buy them. them. You value them at a certain price, correct? But but I don't I don't value them after I have them. In, in the sense that I don't care about their market worth. I'm not buying them with the, the intent of having appreciation value as you would if you're buying stock in a company. It's not a linear comparison. There are some similarities, but not enough to where you can say that I'm buying stock. But if you in came my to a crowd. point where you had to turn around and sell those cards to save your house, to save, to, to take care of your family. They, they, do, they the are an family. asset, but they're not a commodity. And here's the thing. So now, so now we're going to say that that Mike Trout is going to be an IPO on the stock market tomorrow. Come on, I think this is this is what pissed me off yesterday, and I started muting a couple of people who were trolling me because they were just trying to poke the bear, and it was getting really. Was, on this, I wasn't. On the other stuff earlier in the week, I was because you were letting after like a week later, letting guys get on you about topics that I would just I don't like. I tweeted out like, let it go. I turned out the weather, the little girl spinning around. Mike, what are your thoughts? You want to say something, Mike? Yeah, I think you're you're I think the people that have a problem with that comment are taking it way too literally. It says it's the closest thing that you can get to. For many people when they buy 
not the way that they should, but the, when many people buy a stock, they want to participate in the success of that company. They feel like they're connected to that company at that point, and they want to participate in the success of it. When somebody buys a sports card of, of some of their favorite players, they want to participate in the success of that player's on-field results. And so when they do that, that's, the, the, again, the closest thing that you can come to. It's not saying it's the same thing. It's not saying that you evaluate players the same way, that you have the same financial risk, uh, upside and downside, whether you're talking about a, a stock or ownership, you know, ownership in a company through a stock or ownership of cardboard for a, a, a sports card. I think you're you're going way too literal when you get bent out of shape on on this whole comparison. I, I think it's 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 much more high level than that, and, and I don't think I think you're you're making it into more than it's intended to be. If the last guy, the sports card investor, was a clown, this guy's just a flat ass tool. And I've looked through his timeline, and it's just. I, I don't believe that that sports cards are an investment medium, and that's where that guy and myself. Yeah, that's your opinion. I, I. That's no, your. That's opinion. why. That's why I just said that. I don't believe. I said I. Yeah. I, I didn't say it's not. I said I don't believe it's an investment medium, and there are a lot of smart people out there that agree with me. If if you do, that's fine. Hey, you're you're welcome to to invest using that term loosely, as you see fit. It's your money. You can do with it what you want. You can put it in the fireplace and burn it for all any of us should care. If we're, if we're just, if we're, if we're looking at it in a vacuum, it's not a smart investment medium because but it are is, there any smart investment mediums? The stock market's not either. Let's be honest there. It, sure. it depends. There, 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 there are ways to mitigate your risk to where, yeah, it, it's smart enough. You know, you know, it, but, it depends on what you're, you're actually, I don't want to make this a stock market show. No, but, I, but I'm just, it's, the same, it's the same concept. In the, in the the risk we're we're literally talking about a guy that quoted himself. You know, all, when, when I read that whole thing, I looked at it like when Michael Scott quoted himself, having quoted Wayne Gretzky. And I'm like, this guy is just a knucklehead. And then I started reading through his timeline and it was just the same BS and rhetoric. And it's just like, this guy is not for me block because all I'm going to do is end up uh, quote tweeting everything he said and trying to blast him. But hey, he's not for me. So I'm not somebody that should follow him and read his crap because oh, I'm he not I mean, I, I, the tweet came across my timeline. I was getting gas last night and I thought it was just an interesting point. It's a 50,000 look view of, of sports cards. And it's a very, it's a very basic ABC kindergarten view of it, I suppose. But it, it does have, there's, there's, there is merit in it. It's a way to look at it. If you're going to be in this hobby, and people, people, there's, there's like, I would say there's like three, four people like in this hobby, like you could kind of classify everybody into, you're going to have the guy like Ben, that's just the, the full bore collector, no matter what I'm collecting my team, my guy, my whatever. And that's all I care about is getting as many of those as I can. And I'm going to sit there and I'm going to look through them. I'm going to enjoy them. And then you're going to have on the complete opposite end, the guy that doesn't know a lot about it, but that has the money that buys high end stuff that's looking to make, you know, turn and, and use his knowledge for her knowledge from whatever, wherever they made their money to make more money off of these cards. And then there's, you know, you're going to have then your, your guys that are, I would say similar to Mike and I trying to make a self-sustaining hobby. And then you're going to have, you're going to have the dealers that are in this to make money to take care of themselves or their family. I think that most collectors are going to fall into one of four categories generally. And this is just kind of that look of, Hey, if you take zoom way back this and it's, it, you know, there's no proof to it. it it's uh, it, I, to me, it's a, it's a quote that that can be taken 20 different ways, but I, I like what Mike said about it. Hey, yeah, there is some comparisons, but it, it's, it's taken back. And I think some, you know, I think some people took to be what he said is gospel and, and, and that's not, and not everything is going to be that way. So and he's not the first person to suggest this, but he quoted himself. Well, and it's like, I could just see, I could just see his fat, cheesy smile, patting himself on the back. Like, 
<laughs> I, I made this great tweet. Man, this is fantastic. My people are going to love me. Come on. I'm right out. because I said so. Yeah. Get the hell out of here with that nonsense, dude. What a tool. And once I started looking through some of his other tweets, it's like, dude, I better just block him and move on because I don't want to see any of his stuff come up because all it's going to do is. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to take, I'm going to take you to a, I'm going to take Ben into a Twitter. Um, not really like um, intervention, but like, yeah, do that. Block him and move on. Get blocked and step away. Yeah, and get these people out of your life so you're you're a happier person. <laughs> Not saying that you're unhappy. Of course. I'm just saying I think sometimes <laughs> you let you let people get no. to you when you should just you should just let it go because the thing is there's people on there that piss me off and say stuff and I'll say a couple things and after that's like I don't have time to waste on you to talk about right. stupid topics. No. We're not going to agree. And here's the thing. Talk. Here's so the thing. Just, I'm just gonna say hey. Two, two things. Let's go back to the Matthew McConaughey, I need it, GIF, right? But what we yeah. all saw that, that question that was posed the other day about, all right, if you were kidnapped and your kidnappers allowed you to continue to tweet, what would you say to allow your, your, your followers to know that you've been kidnapped? I'm cheering for the Yankees. Yeah, so it would, it would be something so asinine and opposite. And, and a few people had had jokingly tweeted towards me that they would have thought it would be something about, Hey, here's a good card to invest in. Um, <laughs> which definitely would have been, <laughs> which definitely would have been one. And my thought is I, I don't like to argue on Twitter. You know, that that's really what it is. You know, it's opposite day, right? I enjoy it as long as it's respectful and it leads to, de- to, to good debate. Cause I can't tell you how many times I've started And a lot of times I'll take an aggressive or antagonistic. No. Specifically, I I know, again, right? Opposite day. Um, But I can't tell you how many times next day I know there's six, seven, eight people in there. You have conversations bouncing back and forth. Everybody commenting on it. It's healthy. As long as everybody has a good conversation about it. And sometimes I get into something today and uh, uh, Valley Collectibles and and Bo. We're going back and forth. I was sitting there watching it because I was tagged in it because I started it. And and so I, I think there's a lot of good room for healthy debate. It's when knuckleheads hop in or knuckleheads say stupid stuff or, you know, sports card investors who are experts buy cases of retail and thinking they're going to become millionaires. At a certain point, you have to let the morons be morons and just wash your hands of them. Steph, I need it. Okay. I need it. Well, on that note, uh, any final thoughts before we head out tonight? It's been a fun show. Mike, thank- uh, happy birthday to me. Twins clinched the AL Central for the first time since 2010. And uh, Wait, Tim kind of cut off Tortuga dancing. Who was saying happy birthday to you? He, he's quoting himself. Happy birthday, Steph. Of course. Steph. Well, hey, Steph. Look, I'm two crown hey. and diets in. All right. I'm a little, just- a little cheery. I'm allowed to sing to myself. I didn't know if – do we want to sing to him? No. Come on. No, we don't want to sing to we, him. We do three no, part- just send me packs of 1991 Fleer. We could, and we could do three-part harmony. I'll do the high notes. And muted. Uh, yes, Mike, thanks for hanging out with us tonight, bud. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad for to have you on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's, fun. it's always fun to be on the show. Uh, remember, we're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific. 10 Central, sorry. On YouTube, I had you guys muted again. Facebook <laughs> and uh, Periscope. Make sure to subscribe and review our show on all platforms. Follow us on Twitter at about the cards. Follow Ben at our trading cards. Follow Steph at Junk Wax Twins. Follow Mike at the Mike Summer. Check out yes, WaxPackHero.com. You always follow me at Big Ship Seventy Nine. Uh, please share your hobby stories, great pulls, and send your questions our way. Keep collecting. We'll talk to you next week. See you. Several links in chat and down below.